Today, I'm going to show you how to make every single mistake an indie dev possibly can. I'm going to show you how to work on projects fruitlessly for years, have infinite collaborations with people that fizzle out and end up in wasted time, and how to end up with no game and way more stress. So let's get into it. Okay, that was dark, but to lighten the mood a little, I was like 75% kidding. I am really going to show you how to mess up your lives as an indie dev though. And on that topic, hello, I'm Sai Narayan, and around 7 years ago I decided to make a video game mostly by myself. And well, um, here we are. It's been quite the journey. I started this project fresh out of grad school and brand new to the games industry. So for context, Project Gilgamesh, the game I started working on 7 years ago, and the game that's kind of playing in the background right now, it was born out of my desire to write a love letter to Prince of Persia and Blade Runner. These were the two things that I loved most as a person who played video games and an ardent fan of science fiction and cyberpunk. It would have the intricate third-person parkour mechanics and extensive environments of the Prince of Persia games, and the scintillating cyberpunk sensibilities of Blade Runner with its gorgeous atmospheric visuals and rain-soaked neon-filled aesthetics. And on top of all of that, it would have an in-depth narrative and a thought-provoking story to boot. In short, I was a delusional idiot. And here's why it took me seven years to learn why I was wrong. So I started learning Unreal back when it was still called UDK. In those days, Unreal was almost more of a level editor primarily, with a couple of other tools for shaders, scripting, animation, etc. that felt sort of bolted on on top of it. If you wanted to get anything serious done, it had to be an Unreal script or C++, which at the time I was really terrified of. And it's funny to think about that in hindsight, as nowadays I infinitely prefer C++ to visual scripting or blueprints and so forth. Fast forward around four to five years, and I'd graduated from Digimon, and I had a couple of student projects under my belt. I built them with Unreal, and I felt pretty confident in my skills as a generalist programmer and a tech artist. I still pretty vividly recall sitting down in my bedroom. I had a big cup of coffee, and I was thinking, all right, this is it. I have all the skills that I'll need to build my dream game. This will be the one that they remember me for. I had a bare bones idea of how I wanted the game to play as a third person parkour game, and an even more bare bones idea of how I wanted it to look and feel. I had just watched Doctor Strange recently at the time, and something that had captivated me to no end was the open your eyes scene. And it still lives rent free in my head all these years later. And I knew that whatever this game was going to be, it had to have fractals in it, and a character that moved between worlds and realms of reality a wanderer of time and space. And so with that very concrete goal established, I started off on the path, filled with the infinite confidence of the very young and the very dumb. How hard could it be, right? The first place to start, I figured, narrative and world building aside, was to work on the parkour stuff. It was what I was most excited to create. It's what I found coolest and would help keep me motivated, especially early on when so much else was still in flux. In hindsight, a pretty good decision, I think. I started with El Hussein Manix template for a custom gravity character controller and built on top of it, pulling in features from the Unreal character movement component for things like collision and obstacle handling and smooth feeling locomotion on the ground and leaving out things like networking and replication because I just didn't need it. It's not a multiplayer game, thank God. This was a pretty good exercise in retrospect for how to write Unreal C++, which is pretty unique compared to regular C++. At the start of this project, I was a pretty average, maybe below average coder, but decent at using blueprints to get things done. And all of this, like over the years, it has helped develop my coding skills, get them, I think, much beyond that threshold of sort of below average skill. And so anyway, I got to work. I messed around with animation state machines. I learned how to interleave gameplay code with animations. I had my mind blown by blend spaces and how fully featured the character animation system is in Unreal. I recall the hardest thing at the time that I ran into was handling slopes properly. That shit kept me up for long hours into the night. And every day was an exercise in hunting down exciting new edge cases for stuff like stairs and sloped surfaces. Ugh, God. The other thing that I spent a bunch of time on was learning how to model, rig, and texture a character from scratch, which in hindsight was an extremely perplexing and bad decision, which I think is a great segue for lesson one in what not to do. Lesson one, don't feel like you have to build everything from scratch yourself. Or anti-lesson one, build everything from scratch by yourself. 
I don't really know why in hindsight it felt so imperative that I had to do everything by myself. It was some combination of pride and insecurity, maybe. If I hadn't built it myself, could I really call it my own work? I was more than some lowly asset flipper, surely. And there may be some truth to that, but there was also a lot of time wasted on things that I ended up throwing away. The whole process of character creation did teach me about sculpting a ZBrush, using tools like Mixamo and Substance Painter and Designer, rigging in Blender and the character pipeline. But mainly what it taught me was that I don't ever want to touch that stuff ever again, if it's at all possible. It did not spark joy. But six to eight months later, a janky character model in hand and a basic movement controller that could handle most ground locomotion surfaces and jumping decently well, I started reading the literature on tuning character controllers for good game feel. Spent a bunch of time tuning different values of acceleration, friction, and air control. Scoured the whole, like, kind of like, you know, the, the hive mind of the internet for articles, GDC talks, um, looking for inspiration from games like Prince of Persia and Assassin's Creed. Implemented fancy debug draw and graphing utilities for velocity and acceleration curves. And you know the funny part? At the end of the day, nothing was more instructional than just trying out different values until shit felt good. Which maybe leads us to lesson two. Lesson two, you can read all the literature on how to do a thing, but it doesn't match up to 15 minutes spent just doing the thing. Or anti-lesson two, never stop looking for tutorials, ever. With the basic locomotion done to a reasonable degree, I then got to work on the thing that I've been salivating to do since the beginning of the project, the actual fun parkour stuff. So at the risk of sounding like a game dev grandpa, at the time, circa 2018, 2019, there were no handy solutions like the advanced locomotion system to reference or asset store plugins that just did everything for you with regards to the parkour. And even if there was, I probably wouldn't have used it because as I hope I've made it clear, I'm dumb as hell. But this at least was a genuine case of me building something that didn't really exist elsewhere. I think the earliest version of the parkour that I built, and there were many, many versions, just used whether the player was facing towards a wall or left slash right relative to it, used like a dot product, and then would trigger a forward, as in like a vertical, or a left right horizontal wall run. And yeah, it wasn't great, but it got the job done. And you could wall run up and cross and kind of get around this test level that I had. And that was around the time the Breath of the Wild had come out, so of course I felt like I had to implement a climbing system, because of course. I ended up ripping it later out, because I realized it didn't really mesh with what I wanted, which is a more high-energy, kinetic parkour system, where you're chaining from one move to the other. And a little bit after this was when I did the revamp to parkour version 2, where because I, I realized that a blend space input could be taken in to smoothly interpolate between animations. And so this worked much better, and looked marginally decent and more or less is the core of what I use to power the wall run animation stuff today. And at this point, I had a decent wall run system and a functional locomotion system, so I decided to take a break from this and start working on some level design and world building aspects. And if you need to take a break, use the bathroom, make some tea, now is the time, because the next two years or so of work I did ended up completely trashed. So yeah. At this point, I had started calling myself a tech artist, and looking around the tech art space, the really hot thing to do at the time was to use Houdini for procedural stuff and automate all the things. So I figured, all right, if I'm one guy, if I wanted to do this, I'd probably have to learn how to leverage Houdini, right? Wrong. Uh, kind of. But obviously, I didn't really realize this at the time, as I was too busy crying as I scaled up the learning cliff that is Houdini for beginners. But I persevered. With enough banging my head against the wall, I started being able to make things in Houdini that were transferable to Unreal. Stuff like blockouts for large-scale level meshes, a procedural spaceship generator to scatter these ships on this space docks area that was the starting level at the time. Some random placement tools for scattering props and whatnot, like you know barrels and stuff like that around the level, a console terminal generator, and so on. It was fun. It got me into Houdini and passed that initial hump. And, you know, that's money in the bank as far as career skills go, because Houdini is, like, quite sought after. So I don't regret it. But, yeah. Anyway, all that bullshit, none of it mattered. All of it was garbage. All of that work went into the shredder. Which brings us neatly to the third lesson. Lesson number three. You need to be okay with throwing things away, even if you spent a bunch of time on them. Or, anti-lesson three. Never throw anything away ever. This is important. Because in order to do anything worth doing and exploring spaces that are yet unmapped, one needs to be okay with encountering dead ends and backtracking. 
It's not really wasted time when you consider that it's an exercise in knowing and understanding what parts of the map and the territory aren't what you were searching for. The cost of not doing this is being driven by the sunk cost fallacy. And I realize I'm hardly in a place to talk about this after seven years spent working on my first game. You're still trying to get that free sub? Hey, I have spent a lot of time and I have eaten a lot of crap to get to where I am today. And I am not throwing it all away now. Is there a captain's hat involved in this? Maybe. But in my opinion, the key to finding out what I wanted out of the project Finding a direction that both satisfied me and seemed feasible was being willing to waste a bunch of time on things that turned out to be dead ends, but then ruthlessly pruning them when I determined that that was the case. It's not easy, but it is necessary, in my opinion. As all of this is fulminating, I also continue to work on the parkour, and that at least there was some concrete source of progress that kept me fueled as I denied the patently obvious for years that like this direction for the game being a traditional adventure, third person action adventure game was not working. <sighs> right around this time was when I did a third massive revamp of the parkour system, V3 for those keeping count. Up until now, the animation and movement systems were synced, but mostly separate in their handling. This isn't a terrible way to do it, but there was often the impression of a disconnect between the animation and the movement, and the classic floaty walk problem that you've seen a lot of games. But there's a problem, or no, there's a solution for this problem, and it's called root motion. For context, all that means is the movement associated with an animation is just stored in the animation itself, as opposed to having the animation sort of be in place where it's just like the character kind of moving, and then you have code that just moves them separately. With root motion, you can take the translation and rotation that an animator decided looks appropriate for an action like wall running, and use that info at runtime to move the character in sync with the animation. This eliminates the floaty animation problem entirely, as opposed to having to dial in a bunch of magic numbers and trial your error, trial and error your way through, like yeah, had how I had to trial and error my way through that sentence to make it look good via the in place method. And so something I noticed going back through years of footage here, which I hope you might agree with, is that right around here is when the parkour starts to look good enough and it starts attracting attention and it sparks interest from people on Twitter. And so three years in and three versions down, and finally we're getting to something that can stand on its own and speak for itself. Which maybe leads into lesson number four. Lesson number four, iteration is where the magic is made and where the secret sauce lives. Nothing will ever look or feel good in its first version. Or anti-lesson number four, never make a second version of anything. This might be the flip side of lesson number three, which is that as one tries things and throws them away in favor of sticking with what works and feels right, you'll notice that what, what's left starts to feel better and rises in quality as time passes. An analogy I like to make as someone that cooks a lot of stews is that the longer you let a stew simmer and reduce down, the deeper the potency of the flavors. The more time every element of the stew has to combine with each other more fully. And incidentally, this is also why I kind of disagree with the common game dev wisdom that as an indie dev, you should work on projects that are so tightly scoped that you can finish them in a matter of months or maybe a couple years at most. This might be good advice for when you're learning how to make games or develop early on, but in my opinion, it's terrible advice for making something that stands out from the deluge of games that are released every day. And you don't have to take my word for it. Here's the CEO and founder of Play Dead Studios, the makers of Inside and Limbo, saying the same thing. You have to take risk. In game industry, you have to take risk. I'm, I'm pretty sure. It's, I, I think not taking risk and doing something common is kind of the most risky past, uh, path here. There's so many games. There's so many standard games. Everything, every game has been made, right? The only way to make a game that hasn't been made before is to take risk. So, Root Motion opened up a lot of other possibilities that would have otherwise been very tedious to implement, like special moves for dashing and vaulting. And it was right around this time that I briefly toyed with the idea for the player being able to fail at parkour moves and trigger ragdoll collisions if they bumped into stuff, which was really hilarious and felt so good to boot. I ended up moving away from it because again, it just didn't fit with the feel overall of what I wanted. But in retrospect, that could be its own game someday. Kind of like a Gang Beasts parkour style thing. But anyway, the other big thing that happened was the advanced locomotion system release. And I took some time to integrate the mantling stuff that was in there into my own locomotion and parkour system. And that was the single most bang for buck I've ever gotten out of a free plugin. Huge shout out to Longmire Locomotion, who might be the maker of the plugin if I remember correctly. 
But now, yeah, the player could move and like mantle correctly on top of surfaces. And yeah, it was I was matching Prince of Persia and Prototype, I guess, in terms of functionality. And the other big thing I recall working on was a massive code refactor. As over time, my movement component and my character class has started to get really bloated with all this code from so many different locomotion systems and parkour features. And my movement component was over 5,000 lines and it was this monolithic monster that handled everything. This is bad, to be clear. It's bad for comprehension, it's bad for iteration, and it makes for really brittle code, where one change here can have any number of seemingly unrelated bugs and regressions pop up elsewhere. So I took around two to three months to do yet another refactor, and I broke up that monolithic movement component into a number of smaller movement layer components, each of which handled movement on a particular surface type. So for example, a ground movement layer, an air movement layer, a wall movement layer, and so on. And this made it so that if I wanted to add a new feature to an existing movement type or add a new movement type entirely, I knew exactly where to go and what to do and what to change. It works like a dream to this day and is one of the things I'm proudest of, honestly, in hindsight. So we're coming up on the end here, for this video at least. From here on out, I spend the next year or so dialing up the cool factor for those parkour animations and polishing those systems to make them flow more smoothly and feel more snappy. The other thing I did, I, I kept adding new parkour moves like sliding and swinging and rope climbing. At this point, my iteration speed for adding a new parkour move was blazing fast because of how many times I'd done it at that point and also because of the time that I had invested in making it easier for me to get things done. From taking four to six months for that first very bad iteration of the wall running, it now took me a couple weeks to maybe a month to get a new parkour move working and looking good from start to finish. And moreover, it wasn't a slog in the slightest. Implementing these new parkour moves is some of the most fun I've ever had working on this game. And it's way more fun than all the tedious level design work I was doing in Houdini side by side that I ultimately ended up tossing anyway. Which brings us to lesson number five. Lesson number five. Finding the fun isn't just about gameplay but also about the very act of making the game. Or, anti-lesson number five, making your game should feel like pulling teeth. The only things you should decide to work on are purely for wide appeal. So much of game development, or maybe being an artist in general, is about managing your motivation. It might be the single most important thing that you can do for yourself. Almost maybe more important than doing the work itself. Which I, I realize might be a wild take, but you know, here's my view. The work will get done at its own pace. You can do things to improve the rate at which you work and make it more efficient, and you can work longer or faster, but I broadly assume that productivity is a constant over a long enough time. And so assuming that productivity is a constant, you factor it out, and what you have left in the equation is persistence, which is showing up every day to do something on your project for an hour, for two hours, whatever, every little bit that you can manage. But the key point is to manage your own mood and motivation so that you can keep showing up every single day. If you mess that up, if you burn yourself out and give up entirely, to me, that is the ultimate failure mode. But as long as you keep going, and no matter how slowly you do it, you'll eventually get to where you're going. But if you give up, collapse by the side of the road, that amazing cool idea you were trying to make will never see the light of day. And finding the fun is an essential part of all of this. It's a lot easier to be motivated when you're working on something you're actually having fun doing. And conversely, if every time you boot up your project, you feel a wave of dread, it's probably not a great sign. And that's it, at least for this video. This covers more or less the period from when I started working on Project Elgamesh way back in mid-2017 up until the end of 2021. And there's more of the story to tell, but that'll have to wait for the next devlog. Five lessons learned in give or take five years of being a solo dev and creating a Prince of Persia style parkour system from the ground up. Actually, wait, no, I lied. There's one last lesson, arguably the most important one, and consider it a reward for reaching the end of the video. Lesson number six, don't listen to me. Literally just do whatever you want and what feels right. Trust your gut. Or anti-lesson number six, never listen to your intuition. Only ever follow the well-traveled roads. Never take risks. These lessons work for me. They may or may not work for you. Ultimately, it's up to you to decide which is which and navigate through the winding labyrinth that is creating a game. I'm a big fan of the saying, listen to everyone's advice and then just do whatever you want to anyway. It's true. Your gut and honing your instincts and ability to trust in them will bring you so much further along than any advice from off the shelf. And so that's it. We're really done now. Download the demo for Project Ilgamesh. It's currently the th third demo, might, hopefully might be the fourth in a couple months and yeah comments feedback thoughts insults like and subscribe yada 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 i'll see you guys next time thank you